Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Uh, so today I will be reading chapter 11 of Dracula, continuing on with our October read-through of Dracula. Uh, Mark at Booktime with Elvis is sick this week. I believe he posted a community post um, on his channel earlier today, um, sort of explaining what uh, explaining his timetable for when he's hoping to be back uh, in, in action here on Booktube. Uh, so in the meantime, while he's out and uh, getting back to healthy. Uh, Steve and I will be going back and forth on chapters, and then when Mark is able to return, we will go back to taking every third chapter like we have been doing up until this point. Um, and so uh, today I will be reading chapter 11. Tomorrow Steve will do chapter 12, and then I'll pick up uh, with chapter 13 on Friday. But for today, we have chapter 11. Um, about halfway through this chapter, there is a section that has quite a bit of dialogue that is written out in a Cockney accent, um, and so it's a bit tricky to read aloud, but I will be doing my best. I just wanted to give a disclaimer um, at the beginning here that this chapter may be a little uh, rough here and there, uh, but anyway, without further ado, let's dive right in. So here is chapter 11, Lucy Westenra's Diary, 11th September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me he was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, but I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep often, so often of late, the pain of the sleeplessness or the pain of the fear of sleep with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep, and lying like Ophelia in the play, with virgin crants and maiden strumments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary, 12th September called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing as usual up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colors, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Miss Westrina, Westenra, coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warm warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha, I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she answered, You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How do you mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went to her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere. She had actually a bunch of them around her neck. I feared that the heavy odor would be too much for the dear child in her weak state. So I took them away and opened the window a bit to let in fresh air. You'll be pleased with her, I'm sure. She moved off into her bourgeois, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen gray. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room, but the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. Then for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair and putting his hands before his face began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said, what have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still sent down from the pagan world of old? that such things must be, and in such way? This poor mother, all unknowing, and all for the best, as she think, does such a thing as lose her daughter, body, and soul, and we must not tell her, we must not even warn her, or she die, and then both die. Oh, how we are beset! 
How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said. Come, we must see and act. Devils or no devils, or all the devils at once. It matters not. We fight him all the same. He went into the hall door for his bag, and together we went into Lucy's room. Once again I drew up the blind, whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked at the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured, with that hissing inspir ins inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said, today you must operate, I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again, the operation, again, the narcotic. Again, some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently, he took an opportunity of telling Miss Westenra that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their odor was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and would send me word when he went to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright, and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westenra's Diary, 17th September Four days and nights apiece. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I passed through some long nightmare and I just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there is not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant, and then long spells of oblivion, and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away, as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam, but I need, to be, but I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake, and dear, and dear Arthur's, and for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again, although the boughs or bats or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. The Pall Mall Gazette, 18th September The Escaped Wolf, Perilous Adventure of Our Interviewer Interview with the Keeper in the Zoological Gardens after many inquiries and almost as many refusals, and, perpetual, and perpetually using the words Paul Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house, and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind... Their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on to what he called business until the supper was over, and we were all satisfied. Then, when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of professional subjects before meals. I give the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas and all our section their tea before I begin to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions? I queried, wishful to get him into a talkative humor. Hitting of them over the head with the pole is one way, Scratching their ears is another, when gents is his flesh wants a bit of a show off to their gals. I don't so much mind the first, the hitting with the pole before I chuck in their dinner, but I wait till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, before I try on with their ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same nature in us as in them their animals. Here's you a-coming and asking of me questions about my business, and I, that grumpy-like, that only for your bloomin' half quid, I'd a seen you blowed first before I answered. 
not ever, not even when you ask me sarcastic-like, if, if I'd like you to ask the superintendent if you might ask me questions without offense that I'd tell you to go to hell. You did. And when you said you'd report me for using of obscure language, that was it me over the head. But the afquid made that all right. I weren't a going to fight, so I wanted, so I waited for the food, and and did with my owl as the wolves and lions and tigers does. But, lower, but, Lord love your heart. Now that the old woman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me and rinsed me out with her blooming old teapot, and I've lit up, you may scratch my ears for all you're worth and not get even a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're coming at. That there escaped wolf. Exactly. I want you to give me the view of it. Just tell me how it happened. And when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair will end. All right, Governor, this here is about the old story. That there, vo that there wolf we called Bersicker was one of the three greys gray ones that came from Norway to Jimrax when we bought him off four years ago. He was a nice, nice well-behaved wolf that never gave any trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for wanting to get out more than any of the animals in this place. But there, you can trust wolves no more than women. Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Miss Tom with a cheery laugh. He's got binding the animals so long that blasted if he ain't like an old wolf himself. But there ain't no harm in him. Well, sir, it, is about two hour, it was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first heard any disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma which is ill. But when I heard the yelping and howling, I came away straight. There was a bear sicker, a tearing like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man, a tall, thin chap with a hooked nose and a pointed beard, with a few white hairs running through it. He had a hard, cold look and red eyes, and I took a sort of mislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him that, was irrit he, that they were irritated at. He had white kid gloves on his hands, and he pointed to the animals and to me and said, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the air he was giving off himself. He didn't get angry, as I hoped he would, but he smiled a kind of insolent smile, with a mouth full of white, sharp teeth. Oh no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh yes, they would, says I, imitating of him. They always like a bone or two to clean their teeth in about tea time, which you've got a bag of, which you've got a bag full. Well, as I was, well, it was an odd thing. But when the animals see us a-talkin', they lay down, and when I went over to Bearsicker, he let me stroke his ears same as ever. That their man came over, and blessed, but if he didn't put in his hand and stroke the old ears, the old wolf's ears too. Take care, says I, Bearsicker is quick. Never mind, he says, I'm used to him. Are you in the business yourself, I says, taking off my hat for a man, what trades in wolves, accenter, is a good friend to the keepers. No, says he. Not exactly in the business, but I have made pets of several. And with that, he lifts his hat in a, as polite as a lord and walks away. Old Bersicker kept a looking at him till he was out of sight, and then went and lay down in a corner and wouldn't come out of the uh, wouldn't come out the whole evening. Well, last night, as soon as the moon was up, the wolves were all beginning to howl. There wasn't nothing for them to howl at. There wasn't no one near except someone that was evidently a calling a dog somewhere out back of the gardens in the park road. Once or twice I went out to see what, to see that was all right, and it was, and then the howling stopped. Just before twelve o'clock, I just took a look around before turning in and bus, and bus me, but when I came opposite to the old bear sicker's cage, I see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty, and that's all I know for certain. Did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was a-coming home about the time from from a harmony when he sees a big gray dog coming out through the gardening through the guarding edges at least so he says but I don't give much for it myself for if he didn't ever say a word about it to the missus when he got home and it was only after the escape of the wolf was made known and we had been up all night a hunting for, in the park for bear sicker that he remembered seeing anything my own belief was that the harmony had got to his head now, Mr. Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said, with a suspicious sort of modesty, I think I can, but I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall, if a man like you, who knows the animals from experience, can't hazard a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I accounts for it this way. 
It seems to me that that their wolf escaped, especially because he wanted to get out, simply because he wanted to get out. From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had uh, that it had done service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in bindage with the worth with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a sure way to his heart, so I said, "Now, Mr. Builder." We'll consider that that first half sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Right you are, sir, he said briskly. You'll excuse me, I know for a chuffin of ye, that the old woman here winked at me, which was, which was as much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this, that their wolf is, a hi- is, is, hiding, is, is hiding somewhere, the gardener won't be, the gardener didn't remember that he said he saw it galloping northward faster than a horse could do, but I don't believe him, for you see, wolves don't gallop no more than dogs do. They don't they don't bind built they haven't been built that way. Wolves is fine things in the storybook, and I dare say that they get in packs and does be chivin some time something that's more a fearing than they is they can make a devil of noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But Lord bless you, in real life, a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever or bold as a good dog, and not half a quarter so much, f- and not with half a quarter as much fight in them. This one ain't been used to fighting or even to providing for itself, and more like he's somewhere around the park and hiding and shivering of, and if he thinks at all, wondering where he is to get his breakfast from, or maybe he's gone down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye won't, my eye won't. Some cook get a rum start when he, she sees his green eyes a shining out at her from the dark. If he can't get food, he's bound to look for it, and mayhap he may chance to light on the butcher shop in time. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes in a walkin' after with a soldier, leaving of the hi- half pint in the perambulator, well then I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one baby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window, and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. God bless me, he said, if that there ain't old bearsicker come back, come back by himself. He went to the door and opened it, a most unnecessary proceeding it, a, a most unnecessary proceeding it seemed to me. I have always thought that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than, dismin- than diminished that idea. After all, however, there was nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red, Riding's, Red Riding Hood's quandrum friend, who's moving, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos, the wicked wolf that for a day had paralyzed London and set all children in town shivering in their shoes was there in a sort of pendant mood, and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent, with his penitent said, There, I knew the old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Did, would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here's his head all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-gettin' over some bloomin' wall or other. It's a shame that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This here is what comes of it. Come along, bearsicker. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fattened calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the escape, the strange escapade at the zoo. That was a rough section, I apologize. Um, Moving forward, Dr. Seward's Diary, 17th September. I was engaged after dinner in my study posting up my books, which, through press of other work, through press of other work and the many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into a rear. Suddenly the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient, with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck. For such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand. 
and as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I, I got in my right, and he was sprawled on his back on the floor. My wrist ble bled freely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort, and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in, and we turned to our, and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and, to my surprise, went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, the blood is the life, the blood is the life. I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good, and then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily, Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forego my sleep. Tonight I could not well do without it. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given, delivered late by 22 hours. 17th September. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time, frequently visit and see the flowers are, so pl are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary, 18th September. Just off for train to London, the arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know my bitter experience, and I know in my bitter experience what may happen in a night. Of course, it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident, accident should thwart us in all, in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra, 17th September, night. I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come, then when I did not want it, then when I did not want it, so I feared to be alone. I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake my mother, and so closed my door again. Then outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing, except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened, and mother looked in, seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, came in and sat by me. She said to me, even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were well and right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me, so she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms, and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her, and at last succeeded, and she lay quiet, but I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while, there was the low howl again out in the shrubbery, and shortly after there was the crash of the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great, gaunt, gray wolf. Mother cried out in a fright, and struggled up a sitting into a sitting posture, 
and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing around my neck and tore it away from me. For a second or two, two she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over, as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all around seemed to spin around. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window and wheeling and circling round like a pillar of dust that travelers describe when there is a, is a simum in the when there is a simum in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down, and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful. Still, I recovered and con- still I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near, a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all around the neighborhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dear mo- of, of my dead mother came back to comfort me. The sound seemed to have awakened the maids too for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what had happened, and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother, and laid her, covered up with the sheet, on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous, that I directed them to go to the dining room and have each a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maids shrieked and then went and then went in a body to the dining room and I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. When they were there I remembered that I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them, and besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum. And looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her, oh, did use, was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with my mother. I cannot leave her. And I am alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead, I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the the draft from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother, gone. It is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur. If I should not survive this night, God keep you, dear, and God help me. And that is the end of the chapter. It's getting quite good now. Um, And so uh, Steve will pick up with chapter 12 tomorrow. Um, Again, I apologize for the uh, rough reading there in the middle of this chapter, but there is uh, quite some tricky dialogue to try to figure out um, how to pronounce and how to read. So I appreciate you bearing with me. Uh, Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next chapter reading. Bye for now.